where did you grow up? Did you grow up in New York, did you say? I grew up, I grew up in New York, yeah. Grew up in Queens, New York. Wow. And, um, you know, in a, in a red brick apartment house, you know, and, and uh, you know, pretty much spent my entire, you know, young younger life and young adult life um, on the East Coast in mm. New York. And then I had my existential crisis, and uh, after 9-11, I was working in the World Trade Center um, for about uh, nine years. Whoa. And um, that's, I, I, after that, I had my whole existential crisis, like, why are we here? What's going on? Yeah. What, you know, what, what am I here for? Um, and I had a fairly, um, had a fairly uh, intense moment. I was, you know, in the wake of 9-11, I was walking in southern Manhattan, past a row of cardboard boxes that people were living in and you know, grabbed my pant leg me in and um, you know he said what's going to be on your tombstone that's a fairly reflective question whoa <laughs> and and I and that just that just zapped me and it, that was like a really special moment that was like a, a weird kooky amazing spiritual everything stopped all sound stopped um, it was like he and I were like the only people on the planet. And like we, we chatted for maybe, it seemed like hours. It was probably you know, 30 seconds. Um, and after that, I like staggered away and like sat down crying and my body was shaking. And um, came home that night and told my wife what happened. And she's like, you got to quit that job. You, gotta, you have to like leave and do something. So mm -hmm. I headed off to, to India. For my little eat, pray, love kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Without the eating and the love. Yeah. <laughs> just a lot of prayer. And that's really where I had like all these kooky and powerful and weird um, spiritual experiences. And um, that's where I really locked down my meditation practice. And that's where my whole new path, you know, um, that was really the seed for it. And I came mm -hmm. back home and all my friends said, all you do is sit around and meditate now. Like, I know, isn't that amazing? Yeah. And they're like, dude, no, you got to do something with your life. I'm yeah, meditate. dude, you got to make some money. <laughs> it had been it had been about nine months that I had not, you know, I was just living on credit cards. Yeah, um, and uh, because you know, right after I quit my job, I still owned a house with a giant mortgage mm. and you know, car payments and all that stuff. And so I was just like, cha ching, cha ching, had to sell my house, sold everything, you know, pretty much. Dragged my wife through this whole. You know, through my nightmare. Crazy. Uh, through my, you know, my existential crisis became her existential crisis. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, I just turned up, you know, people said to me, you know, you need to hook up with um, Deepak Chopra. Why don't you, like, go, you know, check him out. And I'd, I'd done a workshop with him before. And so I said, listen, uh, I'm done with the corporate world, but I'll, but I'll take all my corporate wisdom and share it with you and I'll run your show and you can in exchange share with me all these spiritual teachings. Mm. He was like, all right, let's do that. You know, and the rest is history. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. God, that's crazy. So can you, can you run me through, I mean, you went into some detail, but just what that must've been like for someone to ask you just completely out of the blue, like what's going to be on your tombstone. I was writing about this before. Some, some, sometimes just even just a little tweak and little shift in perspective is something. Sometimes all we need to completely just steer us into this new direction of life, and we're so good at ingraining these programs of habits into the ways we live our lives that, you know, with retrospect, you can just only look back at your life and say, "God, I was so blessed to have had an experience like that." You know, what was that like? Yeah, well, I think I think you know it's a, it's it, it's a Separate from that, it, it's a metaphor. It's a powerful metaphor for, um, I call these butterfly moments. And they've happened I've had several since then where I'll bump into somebody who does not know me, I've never met in my life, and they either like know my name or they say, like, oh, we've been waiting for you, or, oh, thank God you've come here, or, or, or I've got something, I've been holding on to something to tell you, you know, all these years. And like, how could that even happen? Yeah. I travel around a lot and, and, and bump into a lot of scenarios like that but that was one of those moments where i felt like here here i was walking past homeless people you know um unwashed unbathed dirty you know uh 
you know, the soot of the city, you know, ingrained in the crevices of their, of their face. And here was this being that I honestly would probably never take a second look at mm. and probably go like, Hey, get off of me. And, but for some reason, this was, I viewed this as like some kind of conduit for the universe, some mm. type of portal for something much, much, much bigger than me. This wasn't some guy living in a box. This mm. was like, you know, it's tough for an atheist to get this, but you know, this was in my opinion, like the word of God mm. come through this being. And I think, you know, sometimes in, um, you know, it's like a diamond, diamond in, in, a, in a, you know, needle in a haystack or, or, or a diamond, you know, in the rough, um, where we, if we're aware, if we're looking, if we're paying attention, we can see magnificence and powerful messages and guidance um, in the most banal situations. Uh, um, that's that. I talked about India about the time because India is that that paradox. India is like you know you're walking down a street filled with cow manure and you can barely breathe, yeah. and then suddenly you know you turn and there's incense wafting through a window, you know, or you see someone who cut their arm off so they could get an extra penny when they beg, you know, and then suddenly you see, you know, five women walking by in these magnificent, gorgeous, colorful robes. And so like India is that, that, that giant contrast and, and, and paradox. And I think that's really what our journey is. It's to be able to hold those paradoxes at the same time, to be able to, to hold um, the darkness and the light. And mm. see them both, you know, at the same time, without the judgment of one side judging the other. You know, it's like, uh, you know, a terrorist or a freedom fighter. Mm. Well, how about the ability to, to view them both, both to consider them truth? So I think that's really our journey, you know, as we, go, as we move through life, you know. Um, and it's all just, just awakening. Yes. I, I, believe, I believe we're here to, to witness and we're here to love. Mm. That's, that's my that's my assessment and so um you know like when someone says like what's your purpose in life you know well i think it unfolds differently as we move through probably your purpose in bali was different than your purpose in melbourne probably different than your purpose in france and probably who knows what your next you know wave will be but mm. i think you know we're here to to do good to do good work yeah and um you know i think that's uh, that's the beauty of, of the journey because we don't really know what's going to unfold in the next moment and what heartache will crush us or what magnificent thing will, will awaken, and awaken and take our breath away. And that's, um, that's why I love meditation because I believe that medita well, meditation has been scientifically proven now. People have been talking about it for thousands of years. You know, but now they, scientifically they hook stuff up to your brain and do MRIs and check your neural uh, uh, networks. And so they realize now we can actually change the physical structure of our brain. And, you know, who knows how much of our brain we're using, but we know that we can strengthen it. Um, so you can move from like the woo-woo spiritual context to realize there's actually like real physiological, biological, emotional benefits to having a daily practice of stillness and silence. Mm. So, you know, something that can be so, um, so passive, you know, so surrendered to be so powerful. Um, that's really what I've dedicated my life to, you know, teaching people that, um, you know, we actually do transform the world outside of us by transforming ourselves. Oh, man, absolutely. And uh, I think it was Alan Watts that said something like, as muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone, it could be said that the meditation or the someone who engages in that sort of practice is doing a whole world of good. <laughs> I know I've really, I've really paraphrased that, but... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so true. Can you tell me what, just, I, I, I really want to get to all that spiritual stuff, but what was it like for a New Yorker um, having 9-11 unfold in front of your eyes? Because, you know, we all watched it as it was happening. Well, I didn't. I woke up to it as it was happening in the world on, on, on TV. But to, just to, to be there, you know, it, it must have been a different beast. Uh, yeah, well, you know, considering that I worked in the World Trade Center exactly. six months before that, oh. you know, I worked on the 82nd floor of Tower 2, which, of course, no one on that floor ultimately ended up living. Um, but so I was, I was observing the whole thing on the 27th, um, on 27th Street, so 27 blocks north 
of the World Trade Center on the roof of the building that I was I was now this the the COO for and I was pretty much watching something that my mind could not comprehend I think that was the most challenging thing for me when I saw that tower fall which I had been gazing at you know in my childhood and I've been gazing at you know you know you know every day you couldn't live in New York and not see mm. the towers that was part of like everything that you knew was quote real yes and, uh, I even almost bought a house once because I said I want to wake up every day and look across the river and see those twin towers every day I didn't I ended up not buying that house yeah but um to then see that in that moment where Tower 2 collapsed and I knew that there were people inside it and I knew that like what do you, how could that ever happen buildings don't just implode on themselves and and my mind just like sort of snapped you know my everything that I ever believed was suddenly turned upside down you know and on its head and the and the fear the, you know of, of I don't know five seven million um, people in Manhattan that day, the, the fear was palpable. People were like trying to get out of the city, rushing around. There were there were um, F-15s flying like you know 200 feet over the city, you know, at like lightning speed. There were tanks mobilized, moving. You know, no one knew what this thing was. So like so they suddenly pulled out the military and pulled out this stuff. And for days later, um, really within within a, a, a 10 mile radius, you were breathing that that black smoke, you know, and, you know, the, the air was filled still with the, the burnt uh, aspect of that. You know, and they say olfactory system is our deepest, you know, connection to anything. Um, that's why, if, like, if we suddenly smell brownies being baked, we're like, it brings us back to our childhood. Our Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You know, so there's always those, these deep connections, and that one, you know, is, is etched into me forever, wow. you know. The sets and darkness and like you know your death you know you, that, that's what was burning and it wasn't just like the death of people which I don't want certainly don't want to minimize you know three thousand people dying yeah um, yeah and the, and the and the tragedy and the horror but it was sort of like a death of innocence mm. that that everyone experienced simultaneously because yeah. everyone was like -la 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 -la, you know, living their lives everything's good you know blah 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 we're not really affected by things outside of our world um, and suddenly boom yes you are. This is this is we, this is global. We we live globally now. Mm. It's time, you know, we, we were we were we were catapulted out of the safety and comfort of our own little sweet delusions uh, into uh, a, a much more um, raw uh, existence. And that you know, it's no going back to that. Every time you go to the airport and take off your shoes, you know, you know, it's 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 there forever now. Yes. I heard that they were, you know, the play Hamilton. They were they had to play Hamilton. I don't know, like three nights ago up in San Francisco, and someone had a heart attack inside there. But of course, instantly the person next to that guy. This is on. This is on the news. I was just like reading this yeah. yesterday morning. The, you know, the person next to them said he's been shot, and then people start shouting "gun, gun," and then suddenly the entire theater of like you know thousands of people just like poured out into the street people were like diving into police cars and like, you know they had the SWAT team and they like had all of this stuff going on you know and, and that's because that's that's the world we live in now you yeah know? So it's like it's actually possible for someone to be you know shot in the, you know someone to, to walk in with a gun like that. that never happened before that didn't exist before mm. so of course that possibility <clears throat> existed. but I think you know the death of innocence came in that moment and so that was like a big um and of course I knew people who who died in that as mm. well um and it's almost you know it's part like badge of honor and it's part like wounds and scars and i think you know um those scars are at the physical the emotional you know the spiritual level you know i think something like that happens and if you're lucky enough or fortunate enough to be spared in, in a moment like that you have you have serious work to do mm -hmm. you got you got to get busy you know the clock's ticking you suddenly realize oh you know if you, you know, looking for a sign, have it a plane flying into a building. Um, so that's that's the sign that that I took, and from that moment, really from that moment uh, forward, I've um, really um, leaned hard into living with purpose. I try not to do anything that's not um, purposeful, that doesn't add value. You know, so like I don't I don't play online games, I don't do crossword puzzles, you know, I don't watch you know porn online, you know. There's just like I got stuff to do. I'm really busy. 
can't, I can't, you know, I'm never like idly like, oh, I think I'll kill some time. You know, there's like, there's, you know, we don't have enough of it. So why would we kill it? Mm, that's so true. My God. It, yeah, it just would have been unbelievable. You, you're so right though, Dave, like it was, um, evil was really given a new name that day, you know, and we, uh, the, the way you kind of describe the process is the way that from, from how I conceptualize it, the Buddha was thrust outside of his kingdom when he saw all that suffering outside. He saw an old man and he saw like a body rotting and, you know, Adam and Eve were thrust out of the kingdom of heaven and all that sort of stuff. It, but even from that non sort of spiritual sense, when something like that happens to us, you're right, we just go through this impressive ego death and we're just we're subject to this transformation and this realization that our conceptualization of the world is completely false, you know, and there are people out there that now have the power. And I, I guess what the scary thing is, the means to actually like impart that much suffering on other people, it, it just makes you very afraid. And then you coil up and then you kind of have to figure yourself out again, you know, build that sandcastle up again. So from, from that, what, what, um, what led you to India specifically? And then, and then if you could take us through that sort of that spiritual transformation, that'd be great. Well, it's funny. So I came home and told my wife about my encounter with that, um, with that guy. And it was probably, it was probably a week, uh, after nine 11. Wow. So the city was still rocking. And, you know, if you can even imagine, every, you know, it's funny, every time there's, it's not funny, but, you know, it's, 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 it's mind-blowing. Every time there's a natural disaster of some sort, uh, now, um, it's very commonplace. People put up posters all over that say, have you seen this person? Missing, 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 missing. So, um, right in the wake of 9-11, since no one even understood, you know, where did all these people go, um, including their loved ones, there were all these missing person flyers in Penn Station, you know, in Madison Square Garden, wherever you were walking, in construction sites, along the way, you know, hundreds of them everywhere. Have you seen this person? You know, dad, mother, missing, child. Um, mm. It was one of the craziest, um, you know, situations because everyone was just, everyone was, you had like millions of people trying to figure something out and, and no one really glimpsing the truth of that, um, you know, until obviously much, much later. Yeah. Um, but so I came home, you know, I said to, told my wife that, you know, I had this encounter with this guy. He asked me like all these weird questions. And he told me that, you know, um, you know, he asked me what's going to be on my tombstone. And he told me to find my sacred powers. Whoa. And um, uh, I reached into my pocket to give him, you know, to pull out a couple of bills and because I figured that's what he was wanting. And he like pinned my hand inside my pocket. And he said, no, 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 no it's not about the money. The answer rests in the stars. So like, what homeless guy in a hardcore standing level of just beyond you know you know mind blowing wisdom? Yeah. So um, my wife said to me, you know, I noticed you've been really empty lately. You've been really sad. You've been really um, and before before nine eleven that you right. you were feeling that you were purposeless and you were working for money and for people who didn't necessarily you know vibe with you. She's I've written down a couple of things. Maybe you should check these out. And she said. This guy, Deepak Chopra, he's doing a meditation retreat in Oxford, England. Um, and um, it's like a meditation retreat. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. I'm fairly obedient. I quit my job. <laughs> I, headed, I headed off to Oxford for this thing. There were supposed wow. to be a thousand people there. But because it was in the wake of 9 11, there were like 50. Whoa. And uh, so that was like mind blowing. Yeah. Because oh, I had like. You know, in intimate time with with this group, or certainly more intimate than a thousand people. And during that process, you know, Deepak was talking about, you know, that there's this guy in India who's like been doing this. His family has been doing it for a thousand years. And essentially, you go into a room, you put your thumbprint down. He's called the Nadi Palm Leaf Reader. He meditates for like 45 minutes on your thumbprint, and then pulls out this stack of palm leaves which are old and etched and they're written in like lamp soot and in, a, in Tamil not even in Hindi you know they're written in this ancient um, language Whoa. and your entire life is written down on this leaf and uh, and I was like dude <laughs> now you're talking my language yeah. I gotta go there so um, <clears throat> but you have to find the guy you know and India's fairly big um, you know it's like the size of Australia or something you know, who knows how big it is 
Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, so, um, so I got a, a visa while I was in Oxford, England, and I headed off to India, you know, in search of the guru, trying to find the thing. Um, and so I meditated every day, and I was practicing yoga, and I was doing prayers, and I was bathing in the Ganges, and I was, like, doing all the doing all the stuff, and I traveled north to Dharamsala, you know, to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who wow. wasn't there that day, yeah. you know, and then I came home, and I was just, like, you know, traveling with people, and then suddenly I, I encountered, way, way in South India, the Swami Malai, I encountered, I found out, you know, because I'm every place I'm going, I'm like, Where's the nadi? Where's the nadi? You know, palm leaf reader. Nadi means means palm. Right. Palm so, um, so I finally found this guy, and you know, pretty much a lot of people sit there and they ask like three questions. You know, what about my love life, or what about my business, or what about my health, or what about my family? Um, but I was like, I'm from New York, so it's like, bring it, bring it. Yeah. Tell <laughs> me every single thing of my past life, my present life, and my future life. Yes. Right. You know, like the moment of my death, you know, tell me everything. And so that was like my mind blowing experience where this guy revealed. And I would say, I kept, I had a translator there who would translate from, from Tamil into English. And then I would translate back to him, but I was staring into this guy's eyes, like gazing into his eyes as he was like grunting out, reading this leaf. And every time Whoa. he would say something about my past life or about, you know, something that happened when I was a kid, he would say like, Nadi, you're amazing. You know, and then I'd get translated back and he would say, I'm just reading the leaf. I'm, I'm not amazing. I'm just, I'm just wow. really Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, virtually everything that um, he shared with me, you know, he said, you're going to be a meditation teacher. He said, the leaf says that. He said, you're going to be an international author. The leaf said that. Um, there's like a whole bunch of like very, very cooped out stuff. Um, right. And, like, and so after that session, um, I was just, you know, and I had been searching for like the guru, the guru, the guru. And I was laying in a, in a hammock in a cashew forest in Kerala, way, way south India, reading the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. And I was reading chapter two, verse 48, which I had read a hundred times. But suddenly, you know, it starts off with yoga stop kulu karmani. You know, establish yourself in the present moment and then perform action. This is what Krishna is saying to Arjuna. You know, what God is saying to, you know, this devotee. Mm. And suddenly real, yeah, that's how I want to live my life. I want to get really still and then be brilliant. In every moment, I just want to be, have the ability to get still and respond impeccably, say the right things, think the right things, you know, spontaneous right action. And uh, so I headed home, and that's when my friend said, dude, you know, all you do is sit around and meditate. It had been like six months, and that's all I was doing. I was meditating for like eight hours a day. Whoa. Day. And, you know, in between that, I was just practicing yoga. I was just like a total, you know um, – you know, not providing, not not earning anything, yeah. not contributing, not not doing anything. Um, and you know, people were worried about me. <laughs> yeah. Like, Do something. <laughs> and I said, "Come on, you should teach other people to meditate." And I was like, "Dude, I'm from New York. I don't care about anyone else's meditation." <laughs> <laughs> and and then uh, a bunch of my friends did like an intervention. They said, "Well, if you really want to learn something, learn to teach it." And so. I said, come on, go back to your boy Deepak. You know, you've got like some credentials now. You did that meditation retreat with him. That's got to count for something. And it turns out that was a requirement for becoming one of the certified teachers Whoa. at the Chopra Center. So I already had like one of the main requirements. I just had to dive into the thing. So, you know, that's how that journey works. So I started off as just like, you know, a volunteer, then the COO then the lead educator, and then the dean of Chopra Center University. So there was like that just progression where I just kept spending more time, more time. Ultimately, I did meet his holiness, the Dalai Lama. I met everybody. Whoa. You know, because Deepak, I pick up the phone and go, hey, what are you doing? Yes, exactly. Like you came to come around for a beer. <laughs> you know, so I, so, you know, as a, really as an apprentice for 10 years um, in that world, at the same time that I was, you know, doing all my business skills to, to drive the Chopra Center to some higher level of, mm. of, of abundance. Um, and then at the, you know, after it was like 10 years, I was like, you know what? I'm ready for my next wave. You know, because I was clearly here for these 10 years to do that. And now I've got, I've got stuff to do. I got, I, I want to travel the world and share this with kids and with sick people and with homeless people and with military and with cops and with, you know, people who, you know, people in the corporate world who were totally freaked out. You know, 
I didn't know there were tools when I was in the corporate world. It's not that I knew there were tools and I opted not to use them. I didn't know. Mm. I didn't know you didn't have to quickly quick, quick, get your shirt off and blow my from Michael to India and add all this stuff. You know, um, the reality is this: these teachings are within the grasp of every single yep. human on the planet. And we can tap into them and we don't have to. It's not an either or proposition. We can always just connect to that stillness and silence that rests with it. So suddenly when, you know, what I realized in India was that, hey, the guru rests inside. You know, there's lots yes. of teachers out there, but the guru rests inside. And if we can just quiet ourselves down enough, we can hear the whispers of the divine being channeled through us. We can hear our best expression always coming out of us. So mm -hmm. I, I believe that everyone has that ability to uh, channel their yep. best expression. We're not all doing it. A lot of times we're driven by hormones and chemicals yeah. and, um, <clears throat> and conditions. And, uh, but if we can figure out ways to introduce pattern interrupts, breaks in the action, um, whether that's waking up every day and meditating, whether that's taking a breath every hour, whether that's stepping away from our screens, you know, whether that's walking in nature, whether that's you know, um, expressing love to someone that we care about or someone we hate. Um, yeah. I mean, those, those are like the powerful breaks in the action that I think keep us going on this path to our best evolution. Mm. Uh, yeah, definitely. How, how was your wife with all this? <laughs> Clearly, when people say to me, so who's the greatest teacher that you've ever encountered? Yeah. Who's the wisest sage? It's like, duh, there is no other. You know, we're still <laughs> together. She's, wow. She's been with me through all of my existential crises acting out all of my highs and lows um she is the wisest one she's unflappable and uh she's my greatest uh, cheerleader hmm. so um that's you know i'm a i'm a big uh a big proponent of uh of marriage hmm. you know, it, at least it worked for me you know it has worked um and she's probably you know the greatest friend i could ever have and you know when someone sees you at your at your at your bottom and someone can see you um, at what might be your top right now, even though we're always growing and, and transcending that. Um, you know, that's a person that you shouldn't uh, run away from. Mm. You know, and the fact that she's stuck by me is, you know, she obviously saw something in me beyond my patheticness. So, um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, she's um, actually we're, uh, you know, she's at Valentine's Day here. Yeah. So that was like a. Wow. And, and, I, and I am hers. So. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. How does the... People often talk about when you meditate a lot and you find that that stillness and the presence and how it's literally just this omnipresent, omnipotent love that transcends everything. How much of that do you find within your wife? Because I'm really interested in um, what, how to cultivate a relationship that... You know, other people are inspired to to see and 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 gear themselves towards. So I don't know. It's a bit of an abstract question, but the way you were talking about your wife just really, um, yeah, it inspired me a lot. And I hope to kind of have that with um with my lovely one as well. We've been together for two years strong now, so we'll see how we go. <laughs> Hang in there. Well, we're, we're on. We're on. Nice, nice to you. Hang in there. Yes. Um, you know, life is peaks and valleys. It just is. Mm. And you know, they're probably like thirty different. And valley, you know, physical peak and valley, emotional peak and valley, heart peak and valley, spiritual peak and valley. You know, they're all a work peak and valley, a money peak and valley. You know, they're all like moving. You know, constantly. It's like you know, if you look at like an EKG, you know, like just like all these lines moving through our life on a consistent basis. And I think the secret to um, love, even the Buddha would say this, and I don't mean to just regurgitate everything the Buddha said, um, but. Uh, you can't be compassionate without self-compassion. That seed has to actually start with you. You can't be kind to others without being self-kind. Now, of course, you can act kind to others, but then it's an act. Mm. So, but if it's truly in you, if you're really being kind to yourself, you know, let's say you know you made a mistake, you know, you made a big mistake said the wrong thing or you did the wrong thing and there, there are consequences and repercussions. So shall you 
beat yourself up over and over again for 5, 10, 15, 20, 5, 30 years until that, you know, become, until you really give that voice so much power, um, so much power in what you do. Um, or you should be kind to yourself and begin the process of forgiving, assume that you were trying your best, and then try to do better the next time. So if you're not doing that to yourself, when you do that to someone else, mm. that's, that's, um, that's opposed. That's fake. It's absolutely fake. So how much do you want to, how much time do you want to spend acting, acting loving, acting compassionate, acting forgiving, acting kind. Um, if you're not giving all that stuff to yourself and I believe that the person, I'm not talking about narcissists here, but I yeah. believe the person who, who does forgive themselves and who pledges to do better the next time, um, who is kinder to their missteps because we're human, we're flawed, we're mortal, we're going to die. This flesh. Add to that space where we're forgiving, we're compassionate, we're kind, and we're loving. Then it's so easy to then flow that out. It yeah. comes from that, a seed of honesty and authenticity. Mm. And I think that is like a pheromone. That's an attractant to somebody else. So if you want to attract somebody else, begin with the process of saying, you know what, you know, I want to be kind to myself, forgive myself, be compassionate to myself, and love myself. Mm. And that's pretty attractive, right? You know, when you see someone who's, who's feeling good about themselves, that's attractive. When you see someone who's like sad, or like Eeyore, you know, <laughs> the poo, or yeah. like, you know, constantly just like, wah, wah, yeah. let me down her. You know, that's not an attractive, you know. I mean, who does that attract? A predator? Exactly. You know, you know that, that, that doesn't, you know. So I think, you know, when we can, our life here is a journey back to wholeness. Mm. The wholeness that <clears throat> we had right before we were born. We were whole and pure and perfect, and then we came into this world. And I think our entire life is sort of like trying to get back to that state, and not to get back to the womb, but to get back to that state mm. of wholeness. You know, where, where all of our needs are met, where everything is perfect, where we are one with the universe. And so I think in a relationship, um, it's not swaggering around saying, I'm great, I'm this. It's recognizing your humanity and then leaning harder into, into doing better, being honest, apologizing, apologizing to yourself, and then accepting that apology, apologizing to others, accepting that apology. And ultimately, I think, you can actually start living your life in a relationship where you're in service. You know, you're so full that all you want to do is serve. Yes. And so that's, I think, the beauty of a relationship where you're sitting around saying, hmm, my, my coffee's just come to the end. <clears throat> I, wonder, I wonder if my wife's coffee, uh, if she would like a cup of coffee right now. Yeah. Forget mine is at the end. I already drank the cup. Yeah. I wonder what she you know, it's being able to, to shift that type of, and I'm not saying you should run around and go like to be tidying up and <laughs> serving your partner coffee and all the time. But, you know, if we're in service, then if we see the re relationship as like, I'm so full, I got so much love to give, let me serve you with it. I think that's the key to successful relationships. But you got to be full. True. If you're running on empty or even if you're half full, then you need to work on filling yourself. Yes. And so I believe that the secret to all care self-care yeah man i love that quote that quote you said before was so good it was um what did you say you said i'm so full that all i want to do is serve it's perfect it is so perfect and it makes so much it makes um you know for for any sort of layman it makes tangible sense you know like you you're so full that you you, you have nothing more to take or to to fill yourself up with you can only do is give and then we, we work, you know, reciprocally and, you know, help, helps help and, you know, give, give, give. And it's so true. I, I really love that. But did you learn, how much of this did you learn in India? Or was it just come through in your own experience or? Um, everything is probably just a, a swirl of, of everything that I've studied. Mm. Um, I'm, a, I'm a really good, um, I'm a good student. I pay attention. Yeah. I listen. 
I'm always looking for, for who's the smartest person in the room to let me sit next to them because that's yeah. not me. Yeah. Um, so, um, and I've read, you know, I, I, I've read a lot, and I am a student of the of, of the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. And for the last uh, seven years, uh, I've been holding my own teacher trainings to like share this, you know, to like channel this. So, so you know, my teacher training includes teachings of, of the Gita, teachings of the Tao, teachings of um, modern modern teachers uh, as well, uh, as well as the Upanishads and all, all the ancient texts. I believe that, you know, that's why I wrote the book Sacred Powers, because yeah. I believe there's like massive overlap in like so many wisdom traditions that exist 10,000 miles away and then and happened thousands of years ago. And I think that um, there is wisdom there. It's not just, oh, you know, it's not like, oh, the Bible, you know, read it and then, you know, you'll know the truth. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, I think a good amount of skepticism is really important. Yeah. I think, I think um, probably having more questions than answers is really important. I think when you find someone who says they have the answer, run really fast <laughs> away from that person <laughs> as quickly as possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I think if, if we are to be teachers, we also must be continuous students, students of life, students of these, you know, timeless wisdom traditions. And, you know, I don't consider myself, um, I'm not big on dogma. You know, I think dogma chases more people away from the truth than, and holds them in it. Yeah. You know, right up, right up to like meditation dogma. There's a lot of people who say you must have a rigid spine and you must be in full lotus and you must be have hand mudras. Yeah. Jeez, like, I think those are advanced techniques. How about just like sitting down, you know, and watching your breath? How about yeah. that? Something yeah. as simple as that. Um, so I think that um, I think we're all on a journey. Everybody's at their own pace. No one can compare for theirs. I don't believe in spiritual hierarchy. Um, and I think no. Now that we know the guru resins. Hmm. It's, it's just a conversation and then you have to always, always determine you know in this moment like what's bigger than me you know so whether even if you're an atheist then you ask the question like what's bigger than you? solar system okay you know like what's the thing that's bigger than you that makes you realize you're this big and um you're not above anyone else yeah and so and so your next next step probably is to you know, fill your heart. A lot of times we see people like swaggering around or acting, you know, narcissistic behavior, you know, um, or constantly like, you know, pounding their own chest and, you know, telling the world how great they are. That's not someone who's full. Mm. That's someone who's so empty that they're working so hard to convince everyone else that they're full. Yeah. You know, we see that in politics a lot. <laughs> it's true. You know, a lot of, a lot of chest thumping. Um, so I think that, you know, this is a gentle journey. And everybody's got to pick their own things. Some people are going to pick, you know, being tender with their hearts. Some people are going to pick being tender with what they eat. Some people are going to pick being tender with how they use the resources of the planet. You know, some people are going to be, you know, how loud they're going to speak or how much they're going to speak. Um, I think when you start to meditate, you realize there's incredible wisdom in silence. I don't think there's another teaching out there that actually shares that. No. And so, um, you know, a lot of people, most people say, no, no, no. What are the words? You know, you know, what's, what's the message? The message is, you know, keep surrendering. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, uh, I think it all comes back to that seed because I believe that you and I and the 7.6 billion people on the planet and the billions of animals on the planet, you know, um, there's some kind of essence Call it prana, call it shakti, call it spirit, call, you know, whatever. There's this, there's that essence. It's flowing through everyone. It's that stardust birth. You know, we were born at the heart of the star. We're breathing stardust. We're seeing stardust. We're speaking stardust. Um, we're looking at stardust. And so that connects us, which means that like there's much more connecting all of us than dividing us or separating. Yeah. The stuff that separates us is absolute bullshit. You know, that's like just made up crap mm. stuff that separates us. But but it's but it's but it's logical. You know, we have different skin colors, we have different belief systems, we we live in different places, we were taught different things. So it makes sense that we would think that that would be the truth. Um, but the re 
the truth as far as I know is that we, we are all bound together and connected by something. Mm. And I'm not wise enough to know what that thing is. You know, I've, I've, I've had moments where I've thought, oh my God, that's it. Yeah, uh, but, and then it goes away, doesn't it? <laughs> right, right. You know, and, the, and the, harder you, the harder you stay on it, the, the faster it vanishes. Yeah. Um, you know, and so uh, that's why I believe that you don't become enlightened during meditation. In meditation, you connect to that stillness and silence that rests within you. And then you get to open your eyes and come back into the real world. And now everyone you see, it's just a little more space. All your words, all your thoughts, it's a little more calm. All of your actions, there's a little more purposefulness in it, especially if you do it every single day. And so I believe, you know, spirituality, here we are in this flawed, mortal flesh casing. And then there's like up here, it's like, our best version. It's perfect. It's pure. It always says the right thing. It always does the right thing. It always knows the right thing to do. It's really spontaneous right thought, speech, action, you know, and then there's us. And I believe that this journey of spirituality is just the journey we're making always to our best version. Yeah. Where we access it and we take back maybe an eyedropper full or a thimble full of stillness, of silence of our unconditioned self. And bring it, it's not a one-way trip, it's a round trip. Bring it back into ourselves, and maybe we're a little bit better in the next moment. You know, maybe we're a little bit kinder. Maybe we're a little bit more insightful. Maybe we're paying attention a little bit more. And um, maybe we're a little better of a witness to see what's going on before we act or think or, or judge. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I love what you said about how across all the different religions and cultures and myths and symbols and, and messages, there are so many of the same sort of thing. And, you know, even even as a classic example that Jesus was tempted three times in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights before he became enlightened and Buddha went through the roughly the same sort of thing, three temptations under the Bodhi tree. And and something that I came to realize as well was, you know, in trying to, trying to move away from atheism because when I, I kind of realized what it was, it was just a a thing for me to judge. Therefore, I didn't have to think because thinking scared me. When I started looking back into this stuff, because I was raised a Christian, a Catholic specifically, um, I came to realize that it wasn't it wasn't all the dogma stuff. It was just like teachings about how to live an individual life um, that's connected to service, you know, just a better life, a better life. And this was this is what people have been following for thousands of years. How can we throw the baby out with the bathwater like sure they're kind of cemented in their times where you know they, they don't have the uh, the luxury of modern science but they did understand you know a, a lot more than i i personally gave them credit for and um you do you you just come to understand how life is bigger than you and they've been billions of, of people before you that have, that have looked up at the stars and been just be like what the fuck is going on and this is what they wrote, you know? So maybe, maybe it'll help you too. Um, I thought that was really good. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the amazing aspects of that is that realistically, um, the most indigenous cultures and civilizations going back 10,000 years, um, they live so closely with nature. Mm. They live so closely in rhythm, the tidal rhythms, the lunar rhythms, the circadian rhythms, the seasonal rhythms. You know, these are people who really were in touch with the larger, the bigger picture. And I think in our society, so many of those things have shifted. You know, we watch TV till two in the two o'clock in the morning. So there's an artificial light on, you know, eight hours after the sun has already gone down. Um, how more disconnected could you possibly be from the source of this entire universe yeah. than, you know, living inside a room, not going outside and waking when the sun goes down. And we're not, you know, we're not vampires. We're not, you know, we're not coyotes. Uh, we're not raccoons. Yeah. We actually are diurnal. We're not nocturnal. And, um, you know, we were meant to live uh, in harmony with all the rhythms around us. And I think that, you know, you look at our planet right now and you look at like what's going on, and, you know, 
really, you know, I'm not going to judge it good or bad, but there's massive disconnections. Yeah. You know, in all places. Um, you know, that's that's why we've poisoned the water because we we didn't realize. Oh, we are the water. That's why we've poisoned the air because we were like, oh, uh, that thing we breathe. Let me pump some crap into it. <laughs> um, you know, these were never things that would have been done. By these um, indigenous ancient civilizations, and uh, so it's just like it's an interesting thing how far we've come, stepping away from the wisdom. Mm. And so you know, but here's the reality: we were born into this world where there is this technology, where there is this stuff going on, where you can be in Las Vegas, you know, 24 hours a day in a casino and never even know whether the sun is up or down. Um, yeah. And, and so we have to, like, okay, what's the best that we can do in this world? You know, because I don't think the answer is crawling into a cave mm -hmm. and, and living there, you know, because I've meditated in caves in India. And guess what? Your thoughts are really, really loud in that silent, dark, black cave. And the mosquitoes are really big inside that cave, too. Whoa. So, um, so, like, what's the. None of us live in a soundproof room. None of us live in a recording studio. None of us are sealed off, truly. Um, and so we have to figure out, knowing what I know, in this world that I am in, how do I bring my best version with all of that? And that, I think, may be a bigger challenge than those ancient indigenous cultures have. But why not start with the things that they all agreed on were the, you know, the, the aspect. Um, and that's really, you know, the, the um, I highlight that in Sacred Powers as the five divine principles, you know, the divine principle of one, the oneness of existence, you and I are one, you and I and something is one, it's bigger than all of us, the divine principle um, of awareness, you know, we are definitely living our lives from a place of attention, intention, and action, the divine principle um, of rebirth, we must, to move forward in life, we must keep rebirthing ourselves. Yeah. It's so critical. We must reinvent. We must recreate. We must be willing to pick ourselves off, shed our skin, and then step into a new beginning. Yeah. The divine principle of infinite flow, we're, we're not the end or the beginning. Even Einstein said energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. So we are in this constant, endless, we're like hummingbird hummingbirds, you know, sort of like pollinating each other, dipping our back <laughs> into all these different spaces and then going on and dipping it into another, yeah. and taking a drink someplace else. And in that process, there's a ripple of ours, you know, some type of flow flowing out. And I think the divine principle of inner fire, which is our passion and our purpose um, and our heart, mm. you know, we need to live from those places. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of noise out there and there's a lot of conversations and there's a lot of answers to everything, but those are five overlaps that I, I, that I found in cultures for thousands of years and are as relevant now, certainly, um, as they were then. I think if we can live, and I'm not trying to preach a, a philosophy or a dogma or a religion or any of that stuff, yeah. but I think if we can just look at like, oh, isn't that interesting? You know, people in China and, and, and uh, Aborigines in, in Australia, same same vibe, same practices, same. And the difference was then it, it was the sages or the rulers or the medicine men or yeah. the or the medicine women, you know, of the tribe or of the clan who like held that power. It's available to all of us now. We have to realize we're not living in tribal societies. Yeah. You know, in that same context, and so we have to. Uh, you know, we have to realize, you know, we go to a place like India where there's a, a billion people. It's unfathomable. So, like, thing, we, we can't apply the same kind of principles to those kinds of worlds as, as was done 10,000 years ago. Yes, of course. Or even as we do in, in, our, in our own world. So that's why we're trying so hard so often to, like, fix stuff outside of us. And I think this, the key is really working on ourselves mm. it's, it's like think globally but you gotta act lo locally and what's the most local place your heart god it's true 
And look, I, I love, man, <laughs> I could sit here for hours, Dave. It's good. It's really good. I, I really appreciate this. Um, what would you give to someone who's perhaps just just at that point where they're starting to question uh, their life and, you know, they're probably, they may be in that, just to use a cliche, they're in that nine to five um, job and they're starting like, you know, what's more like, you know, what's, um, what, what practical advice would you give to someone like that, that, you know, that, that wants, wants more? Well, <clears throat> when I left my job and blew up my life, when I was living in New York, um, I didn't know what I wanted. I knew what I did. Nice. Pain can be an incredible motivator. Pain can be like one of the wisest teachers that we have, you know, to get you out of whatever it is that you're doing, yeah. even though you don't know what it is that you'll be stepping into. So I think that's really important. But I believe that you and I, and those of us who have had the aha moment, for, for lack of a better word, or the insight to move to another place. We experience a convergence of message, messenger, and timing. The message was so clear, and it was coming out of the mouth of someone or something. That could have been a book, or in person, or a video, or we even just heard something. It was coming out of the mouth of someone that we said, I seem to resonate with that with that person. And the timing had to be perfect. There had to be a window where you were willing to surrender, maybe from pain, maybe from confusion, maybe from overwhelm, maybe from you saying to yourself, I don't know all the answers, and suddenly <clears throat> that window opened up. I think if you have any of those things not in alignment, the message doesn't come through. It's like someone calling you up on your phone and they're speaking in a foreign language you don't understand. And they could be saying the most, you know, they can be <laughs> the single secret of the yeah. universe. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I don't even know what they're, I don't know what they're saying. Yeah. And so I think the answer then is always be paying attention. And that's why we cultivate that with meditation. Pay attention. So when we meditate, what are we really doing? We're cultivating our ability to witness. So if we can always sort of like have that window open to us. And of course, if we're, you know, if we're angry or if we're frustrated, if we're sad or if we're grieving, you know, that window's going to be closed. And yeah. if we're, if our heart's been broken, that window's going to be closed. And if we're struggling for money, that window's going to be closed. And that's why getting to that still point, because that's when you're most receptive. If we can get to that still point proactively on a consistent basis, there is that little bit of stillness and silence that almost like creates a mini window for the message and the messenger to come into you in every moment. And mm. I think when, when, when moments unfold where you say to yourself, I wonder if that's a sign. It's a fucking sign. <laughs> and run with it, right? It's like I was at this, um, I was at this clairvoyance conference and with, with James Van Prague. He's a psychic medium, famous guy. He's the guy who they named the, the ghost whisperer after. Oh, wow. And, so, you know, he's like, he's like the shit. Yeah. And so I'm teaching people to get still, and he was teaching them to then connect to the realms. Whoa. So whether you buy that or believe in that or you know, what do you think that whole thing is, is gibberish, I'll just share this one thing. This woman raises her hand, and she said, you know, my son died six months ago, and I just want to share this, this one story. Um, I came home two days after he – we came home from, from the funeral, you know, two days after he died. And I sat at my dining room table, and I said, God, or his name was Travis, God or Travis, if you're connected to me, if you can hear me, blink the lights. And, and the giant chandelier over the dining room table blinked. Wow. And she said, okay, not sure if that's really the sign. Yeah. If you really here if you can all the lights that are white turn them blue and then suddenly all the lights started flickering and so they don't like actually turn blue but they all started getting like so like they could could be perceived as blue wow and then she was like you know so her question she asked james graham Prague. she goes you know i'm not sure that i really considered those signs is there a deeper sign that i could get and i was like 
Fuck. Are you <laughs> kidding me? Well, you that's know, right. Signs are like so, so odd. They're like two by fours. Yeah. Smacking us in the head. And we're like, no, no, no. I need a, exactly. I need a better sign. I need a deeper sign. I need to know I for sure. Right, right. You know, right, right. Exactly. You know, so here you are trying to, you know, have a miracle confirm certainty. Yeah. You know, and the reality is, you know, uh, uh, um, if you, we can get this sign, you, know, you could be sitting here and suddenly you know, have a memory of something that yeah. really touched you. And, and suddenly in that moment, you know, that's the message, you know, it's like be open, get to that space. So I'm not commenting on psychics or mediums or any of that or, or other realms. That's not really what I, what I want to talk mm. about. That's not my thing. That's not this thing. But what I'm saying is we are given signs yeah. on a consistent basis. And when we see them, we should actually laugh a little bit. We, we could say, huh, looking for a sign? I guess this is it. And then allow, you know, what comes next. Yep. The sign doesn't necessarily, that's not the answer. Essentially what it's saying is, though, perhaps coming soon. Yes. You know, I, when I see a sign, what it means to me is pay attention because there's going to be a convergence of message, messenger, and timing. The timing is right because I'm open right now. Come on, message. Come on, messenger. So that could be an internal message, that could be an external message, that could be a book you read, something you see on TV, something your partner whispers into your ear, something you just witness. And I believe that would be my number one thing. Meditate so you can always allow yourself to have that pattern interrupt, that break in the action, so that your hormones and chemicals are not hijacking your emotions. And once you have a meditation practice, and we know you can do that with Inside Timer, yeah, you do, I do. There's a out there. You can do, you know, on my website, davidg.com, there's like over 400 free guided meditations. There's enough stuff out there, so there's no yeah. excuse why people, when they go, oh, I'm too busy to meditate. Yeah. Really? Get over it. Get over yourself. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, if we have a meditation practice and we're willing to be open to signs, then we will get answers. You know, a lot of people mm. say, oh, if I knew when I was – 18 what I knew now you weren't ready you True. weren't ready when you were 18 you needed to have some life experience you needed to stumble you needed to fail you needed to to falter you needed to to have your heart broken you needed to have you know all these horrible things and great things happen to you to bring you to this moment I love it. so I'd say if I could give like one piece of advice to someone trust mm. yeah I love it oh Dave where can where can people find you and um and yeah t- tell us where we can find your book. Uh, well, um, my uh, I have free book Secrets of Meditation, Destressifying, and Sacred Powers. Great. You can find all on wherever books are sold. Yes. Um, Amazon, they're all on audiobook. I've also recorded all the audios for them. So if you do audio, you know, audible right. to audio, uh, you can do that. You can visit me at davidg.com, d a v i d j i dot com. Um, and find out I have, you know, on my website are um, scientific studies uh, and meditations. And I've, re- I've, I've recorded a video every single weekend since 2011. Wow. I've recorded a guided meditation every three days uh, since 2005. Um, there's, there's lots of stuff out there, you know, Spotify and Pandora and Amazon and iTunes and Apple Music and uh, you name it and Tidal. No. It's out there. Yeah. Um, so you can find me anywhere. Plus, I'm probably coming soon to a city near you because uh, I travel the world. I'll be in England and Ireland and Israel and India and Amsterdam and Canada and all throughout the United States. Awesome. I get to be in Australia. Oh, you got to come down. I get back there. I'll go back there. You know, I'll go there for the first time. And yeah. We can... Dude, that would be awesome. I would love that. Yeah, we can grab a coffee, grab a beer. I'll be sweet. Cool. Well, Dave, thanks so much for coming on the show, mate. It was, um, I love these sorts of discussions with people like yourself because I think like a, a really good teacher is someone who can, can talk about their experience, but then they can also actually give back these practical tools so people that don't understand that lingo in, in really easy to understand forms. And mate, you've, you've, um, you've killed it. It was just so beneficial for me. And I think, I think the listeners are going to get heaps out of it too. Beautiful. That's great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And um, thank you for the work that you do uh, because, you know, you're, you're spanning the globe, you're touching on all these little pieces and, um, you know, you're a powerful force 
for transformation. and so i really appreciate you.